Three. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Daniel Rotenberg, Director, of Department of Real Estate and Asset Management. RE3 is a resolution of the Miami City Commission accepting and approving or rejecting and denying the protest by New Rickenbacker Marina LLC and Virginia Key SMI LLC for the RFP number 12-14-77077, sorry, for the lease and develop the City of Miami owned waterfront property for the marina restaurant ship store uses located on Virginia Key. Okay, um, something, this is a, a bit different from normal bid protests. I typically see a bid protest, if we do see one, where you have one person that's protesting the bid. So uh, there are two questions that really are of grave importance to me. I think first, I think what we all need to know is that, as I understand, this is not a quasi-judicial uh, hearing. This is a, an executive hearing, correct? Or administrative Correct. Process. Correct. Not quasi-judicial. It's going to be based on oral argument and presentation alone. No questions. So we don't have to worry about any rules of evidence or anything of that nature. Correct. Um, is, is there a certain standard of review? Or is there is there something that the commissioner should know that the decisions turn upon? The standard of review for reviewing a bid protest in Florida is that the commission could uphold the city manager's recommendation to um, deny the bid protests unless you think that that recommendation is either arbitrary, which means it's not supported by facts or logic, or capricious, it's taken irrationally without thought or action, or departs from the essential requirements of law, or is subject to fraud, collusion, bad faith, or similar factors. Uh, that is the standard of review under uh, many Florida cases for uh, bid protests. Do all the commissioners understand that? Do you have any questions about that standard of review that he just stated? I did not realize there were very specific criteria under which we could say that the manager's decision was correct or incorrect. So this is new for me. Could you list those again for me or bring them to me in a printout, please? Well, the manager's uh, decision can be upheld unless you think it is arbitrary, not supported by facts or logic, or capricious, taken irrationally without thought or action, or departs from the essential requirements of law. For example, um, due process, uh, sunshine, uh, charter requirements, uh, or is subject to fraud, collusion, bad faith, bias, or similar factors. That, that's generally how they are evaluated, sir. Okay. Any further questions on that issue? Seeing none, I know that there is, I, I, I would think, because upon my review of, of, of the law, and I would love to have you all's opinion on it, but this whole question of does a third in line person have the ability to file a bid protest? So if, can we have just a position stated um, by either the administration and the attorneys? And if this opinion is in, in the contrary or in the negative for any of the bidders, I'm going to give the bidders an opportunity to, to counter the argument so that we can make a decision I think that's, that's for the benefit of the city of Miami. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. That means the constituents, not the administration. Uh, good evening, members of the Commission. My name is Miriam Ramos. I'm Deputy City Attorney for the City of Coral Gables. I am your uh, conflict counsel on this case, representing staff for the City of Miami. Um, I was asked by Mr. Lean, uh, who typically serves in this role, uh, to give you his apologies. He is in Europe with his family enjoying a vacation, and so I am here representing staff before you. Uh, on the issue of the third, actually there's two issues if we could take up preliminarily. Mr. Chair, as you spoke about the third ranked bidder um, and whether they have standing, that's one issue. And the other issue is about a supplemental um, additional item that was provided just a few days ago that uh, we believe is, should not be considered and has been waived. May I ask you a question? The second, the supplemental item is that by the third bidder or is that by the second bidder? No. The supplemental item is against the first by the second. And it talks about, um, if you want to take that up first, that may be an easier item than the, than the standing issue. It essentially uh, talked about some information that they claim was not provided to the selection committee. Uh, however, under 18.104 of the city code, uh, the um, 
the only items that can be brought up during a bid protest are those within the four corners of the written submittal, and this was outside of that. Furthermore, uh, the information that they're alleging now uh, to give to all of you was information that was readily available and known at the time that they submitted uh, their proposal. Okay. So in our opinion, it's been waived. So you framed the issue. So at this point, um, unless the second proposed bidder wants to uh, concede that thought, I would like for you to take the lectern and I'll give you an opportunity, now that you know what the issue at least is framed to be, to make a, a brief three-minute argument. You can have this lectern here. And please also announce yourself for the record. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the uh, commission. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Miguel uh, Diaz. I always get your name wrong. De La Portilla, <laughs> uh, co-counsel, um, and Eloet Ruiz. Uh, is the question asked whether or not this commission can consider something that was outside of the timely filed bid protest? Is that the question? I believe that that's what the question is, yes. Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. Um, 18.104 of your code really speaks to the procurement director's ability to consider items in a bid protest. And uh, we agree that um, as to the procurement director, uh, he or she could consider, uh, only can consider things that are in the timely filed protest. However, the commission not only has the uh, ability and authority, but uh, respectfully, I believe, is duty-bound to consider any relevant evidence to which it has been made aware. And so whether that came in supplemental materials filed by Suntex uh, uh, outside of the initial protest, or whether the commission learned about it from some other source, uh, perhaps the media or somewhere else, um, respectfully, I don't think the, the commission could simply uh, ignore that um, or put its head in the sand, for lack of a better word, uh, and completely not consider that simply because Suntex pr uh, provided that information uh, outside of the, uh, the protest. One second. So it's our position that you should consider it and you should hear it, and we do intend to discuss it. I'm sorry, who does yes. represent? Can you state who you represent also? Oh, sorry, uh, Gary Brown on behalf of Suntex. Which is the, the second? Firm, yes, the second ranked bidder. Sorry. The, the law... Well, the, the ordinance or code that he stated, is that the same code that you stated? It is, and can my understanding... Can we make a, a copy of that part of the code available to the commissioners so that we can read it ourselves? And my understanding from your attorneys is that it has been interpreted to also include the commission, not just the procurement director. We can make you a copy of our code section, um, which has to do with... When you have a bid protest, it has to be pretty much within the four corners of the protest itself, and anything outside of that release does not have to be um, taken into account by this commission. But I will make you a copy of the code section so that you have that. Does not have Mr. To Chairman, be. That, right, that's, not that's why that's why I prefer to see a copy of it. M Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, add to this, let me let me first introduce myself. I'm Miguel Diaz La Portilla, 200 South Biscayne Boulevard, 36th floor. I'm co-counsel with Mr. Brown, and we're representing Suntex. I'm with Arnstein and Lair. The provision of the code pertains to the decision of the procurement director, or in this case, the dream director, because when it comes to real estate, the dream director is the one who decides bid protests. It doesn't carry over to the commission. There's nothing in the code that says it carries over to the commission. There's no explicit language to that. And the reason behind that and the logic behind that and the policy behind that is what needs to be considered. See, we're talking about, we're talking about a proposer that dumped 25,000 gallons. Wait, wait, before we go on. 25 million gallons, rather. Counselor, I don't want to get into the facts <laughs> of what it is just yet. Before we, and, I, and you know well, why. We'll, we'll move them, we'll because I get wanna, to that I later. Get, right, I want to clarify the law. We'll get to that later. facts on, you know, before us to consider. Because gotcha. I don't want to, to really to bias the commissioners to hearing information that they should consider without knowing first if that information should be considered. Okay, and so to the point of should it be considered. First, the provision in the code only applies to the decision of either the procurement director or the decision of the dream director when it comes to real estate. There's nothing explicitly that ties it to the commission. And here's the reason for that, the policy reason for that. The policy reason for that is that when a matter comes before the commission, particularly something that is an executive matter, 
It's within the discretion of the Commission to hear anything that is pertinent and relevant to the Commission. And the reason for that, the reason why the Commission should consider anything that is pertinent and relevant to the Commission in making the best decision, the decision that is in the best interest of the City, is because this information, regardless of where it comes from, whether it comes from an, a protester, whether it comes from a media report, whether it comes from just, you know, some independent third party, if it's relevant to the responsibility and responsiveness of a proposer, the Commission should consider it. There, and, and there's very strong po public policy behind that. And here's why, too, and without getting into the details, because I, I heard your admonition and I'm going to abide by it. But without getting into the details of exactly what we're talking about here, here's, here's an important point. The RFP itself required disclosure, required disclosure of issues having to do with environmental damage. And, and we have and, a factual argument to that. We dispute that right. allegation. Okay. But the RFP itself, the document required disclosure of certain items in, re regarding impact to city-owned land, environmental impacts to city-owned land. And so the RFP said that if you had a history of environmental damage to city-owned land, that you had an obligation to disclose it. And then the Commission, the dis ultimate decision makers in any kind of award of a contract, can decide whether they're going to say that that proposer is responsible or not. It may be grounds for disqualification on responsibility grounds, but it doesn't require disqualification. However, the same RFP, and I can give you the site in the section, the same RFP we're talking about here also says that failure to disclose, failure to disclose impact, environmental impact or damage to city-owned land is an automatic ground for disqualification. Why did you write that in the RFP? The reason you wrote that in the RFP is because you want proposers to, for lack of a better term and no pun intended, come clean. If there's an issue regarding environmental damage, disclose it. Then you all decide whether that's enough to disqualify them or not. But failure to disclose it, the, it, according to the very terms of the RFP, is automatic grounds for disqualification. Why? Because you want a proposer, because if anybody knows about this environmental damage, alleged environmental damage at this juncture, we're not going into, into uh, the details or the merits of it, it's the proposer who was involved in an environmental incident. That's the one person who knows. To not allow it in, to not consider it would be to ignore something that goes directly to the responsibility of a proposer, and you have to award to a responsive and responsible proposer. The law requires that too, that wasn't said by your city attorney. You, it, the, so it goes right to the heart of responsibility. It's always an issue. It's always germane. It's always relevant, and it's always considered in any kind of award. And that's just procurement law 101. It's as basic as, as, as it gets. No, Counselor, so I, I, I completely understand that part of your argument. <clears throat> My first question is, does the RFP require disclosure of, say, um, well, first of all, when it says, as the way the council expressed it, city-owned property, does it refer to city Miami-owned property, or is it city-owned property by someone else? Correct, and you, you hit the nail on the head there, sir. Uh, it does say city-owned property, and uh, the city's interpretation, but more importantly, RCI's interpretation, and I'm sure they'll want to speak to this issue, although I think we're getting into the facts here, Before, is that they uh, answered it narrowly, that this did not impact the city, that's my understanding of their argument, and that, again, it was known at the time of, of the selection committee meeting it was known at the time that they submitted the, the actual documents. It was known. It was always known. And from a public policy standpoint, in any, um, in any case where there are deadlines and procedural guidelines, they are there for a reason. You cannot bring things up until the 11th hour as you learn them, especially since they were known at both the initial time of the selection committee and at the time that they submitted their documents. And the counter to that specific before, point is... Before you, before you move on. So this is 16, Section 18104, Resolution of Protest and Solicitation and Awards. We're saying that this is a protest of the awards. Is that correct? Correct. So it's okay. A to C. A to C. Okay. Just give us a second to, to of course. read it. Thank you. 
one second, one second. No, she didn't. She didn't put it in there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I uh, just wanted to know if I have opportunity to speak on this issue. We, we, we may end up asking you to speak, but we may not get there. So I don't want, that's why I don't want any facts to be put on the, on the, on the um, before us just yet. I just want to respond to the issue of whether or not it can be included. Okay. Yeah, I, I may give you an opportunity to do that, but let us discuss it first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just, uh, not being an attorney, I have a question of law. Um, this seems to speak toward... Um, the ability of the protester to be cons the protest to be considered by the administration, but us not speaking to what can be considered by the commission, and noting that this is not a quasi judicial matter, and that goes to my next question. It seems that we'll have quite wide latitude as commissioners to hear what we want to hear. So my question, though, is why is this not being heard as a quasi judicial matter? Do we have the choice as a city to hear it one way or the other, or this doesn't fall into that category at all? <laughs> Pretty much it's based on the case law. Um, it, you don't have a choice to hear it quasi-judicial versus um, administrative or executive. It's based on case law, Florida case law, that the way that this is um, done and the award of a bid, uh, the award of a contract is protested pursuant to this type of hearing, which is basically based on oral argument and such. Thank you. So do I interpret it correctly that um – since this is not in that matter, this speaks to what the administration can hear within a protest, but we as a commission can ask to hear. Exactly. We, have, we have wider latitude. Is that correct? That exactly. N not necessarily. What it's, um, what it's describing is, first of all, in order for you to have a bid protest that comes before you, it has to be in written form. So in the written protest is where you issue all the bases for which um, the protest can be heard by the commission. So this is basically setting out what needs to be placed in the written bid protest so then it could come before you as the um, basically determiners of, of fact and how you want to proceed after that with regard to the protest. It, I, I'm, you know, as I read this, and I'm reading section 18-104, Resolution of Protest and Solicitation Award, Part 2C. It seems to me that the way that this is written, and I'm reading it, I guess, not liberally, but narrowly, because it says that the, the written protest, it tells you first that in order to, for you to, to, to have a bid protest, you must submit it within a certain time period. And then it states that the written protest shall state with particularity the spe specific facts and law upon which the protest of the solicitation or the award is based and shall include all pertinent documents and evidence and shall be accompanied by the required filing fee as provided in section, subsection F. This shall form the basis for review of the written protest and no facts, grounds, documentation, or evidence not contained in this protest is submission to the chief procurement officer at the time of the filing, uh, uh, time of, filing of the protest officer. shall be permitted in the consideration of the written protest. Now, I understand where you're going to go and, and pretty soon I'm going to have um, opposing counsel step up if you continue to make, you know, argument. But before we get there, it then goes into no time will be added for service by mail, etc. When I read this, it seems to me that the chief procurement officer, first of all, is the one that handles our procurement affairs. So everything goes through that procurement officer. And so if you were going to write a protest, a big protest, you might want to let the chief procurement officer know. And it seems to me that that is the vehicle into which brings it before this commission. But more importantly, it, it seems like it could be a due process violation if, if you're considering the fact that 
It tells you to state with particularity the specific facts and law upon which the process, uh, the protest of the solicitation or award is based. So let's think about it. If you must, it gives you a, part, a number of days in which you must submit the protest. You write the written protest, you submit it. Now, uh, the, the winning bidder has notice of what is actually being alleged. The city has notice of what's being alleged. And they have a certain amount of time that they can work on that and, and prepare themselves for a hearing like this that comes before us because we handle the bid protest, not the procurement officer. But the procurement officer lets us know, hey, this is what we're dealing with. So at what point then would it be, and I'll, and I'll just say just a simple fairness, at what point would it be fair to the person who won the award when someone should be able to supplement uh, or circumvent even this requirement to, to make allegations against that person. If they came here today, say, say if, 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 if uh, the number two bidder came here today, submitted a document before us and said, by the way, I have these facts. This came out about X, Y, Z person. I mean, is that trial by ambush? Or and does that violate this? And is that something that the city commission wants to allow to occur in a bid protest? Look, may, may I respond to, to that, you know, uh, series of, uh, of questions? First of all, the issue of whether there was environmental contamination in this case by this applicant is something that is wholly well, within. Let's, let's, before we get into that, but, no, 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 let, me, let me explain. Counselor, can you step over here as well? Yeah. <laughs> This is, is what, before you, Mr. Clerk, do you have your um, the portable mic just to give everybody their space? No, and no, no. okay, thank so you. The reason I'm asking you for a second time, not to get into the facts just yet, is because I don't think you have to get into the facts to make your argument about this. And I'm not going to, but I have to talk about the nature of the issue because the RFP but this requires speak, it. But this part, what we're talking about now, doesn't speak to the nature. It just speaks to the allegation. So, for instance, my I'm, I'll is, make the, I understand what you're because, saying. Because this, is what, this is what I'm led to believe. I'm led to believe that if you did not, in your, um, in your bid protest, if you didn't list a certain fact, or allege with particularity certain events, then you lose the ability to bring that up. Now, in the bid protest, that's what I would believe, in the bid protest. Now, if this comes back, say, in front of the commission for approval, I'm sure you could lobby the commission and say don't approve it, and for these particular reasons, because you feel like it would be a detriment to the city because you have, you have an irresponsible bidder versus a bidder that is non-responsive. Okay, but without getting into the subject matter or even the nature of the issue, let's say whatever it is, if the RFP requires that if there are certain issues, whatever they may be, that a proposer disclose it if they exist or potentially could exist, right, but failure to disclose these are grounds for disqualification. But you would, but you would, you would put that in your bid protest. Assuming right? we knew it, but we didn't know it, and that's exactly the point. But I'll tell you who did know about this issue. The person and the entity that did know about this issue was our CI. I'm not you, talking about the issue. Let me ask you a but they did. We didn't know it. If not, it would have been in there. Let me ask you a question. With your bid protest, when you file your bid protest, do you at that time have knowledge of what the other bidder has now submitted? We have knowledge of what they've submitted, but if they fail to disclose something that they for sure know about because they were involved in it and we weren't, we don't have that material available to us. Should a proposer who fails to disclose something that they're required to disclose be rewarded for their non-disclosure? Well, if I were answering that question, I would say no, but this is the, this is the thing. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm led to believe is that if you have a bid protest, just looking at you know, what we're bound by, section 18-104. If you as an entity have the ability to see someone's bid at the time you file your protest, you know what issues, for instance, you want to, you want to appeal to the city commission about during the bid protest. Uh, at that time, there is information out in the world that you can have, that you can get, but in this case, say you did not receive until after the timing has. I'm led to believe by this language 
that you will be forbidden from using that information in the bid protest. So that's why that's why I'm right now. But I'll, I'll give I'll give if I may quick rebuttal and then I'll also, I'll see the floor. Yes. Um, you know, council would have you believe that this was some hidden issue that they somehow came upon three days ago. The issue that they are talking about was a highly publicized issue that happened several years ago, which they absolutely had access to at the time that they filed their protest. If they failed to conduct their due diligence and for that reason did not include it, that's on them. Councilor. Uh, first, I'll, I'll state my name and address for the record. Uh, Al Dotson with Bills and Sumberg, 1450 Brickell Avenue, uh, representing the recommended proposal RCI. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first, I, I agree with your line of reasoning, but I want to add something else. It's not just 18-104 that governs this. It's also the RFP itself. On page 39 of the RFP, the bid protest procedures are set forth and says, who has the authority to resolve the protest? They would have you believe that you don't have the authority to resolve the bid protest. The only reason this is here is because a bid protest has been filed. And you've already established in 18-104 and on page 39 of your RFP of what must be in a bid protest, the timing by which a bid protest must be filed, and the fact that you cannot supplement it. Can you imagine if you were now to interpret your rules that when you resolve a bid protest, you have a certain date by which you've got to file, and then there's a decision that's made, and then you've got any time you want to file anything you want before this commission um, hears the bid protest. There's only one bid protest, and this is it. There aren't three different bid protest steps. The administration is giving you a recommendation and you will resolve the bid protest. So uh, let's be clear, to do anything after the, the date is to supplement the bid protest, which is exactly what they are doing. And page 39 of your RFP is very clear on that, in addition to 18-104. Thank you, Chairman. Is there any, does any of the commissioners want to make a comment at this point? Okay. So, sorry, I'm sorry, what was your question? No, I just asked if you wanted to make a comment at this point. Or you no. Okay. So, Mr. Dotson would have you believe then that if there is a fact that they know and that the RFP itself requires disclosure on and failure to disclose is grounds for disqualification, that they can just get away without including it in their response and with the constrained time frame of the time that you have to file your protest, if the other proposers, whether it's Suntex or whether it's TFON, they didn't know about it either because it was hidden by and not disclosed by RCI, that RCI then should be rewarded for their non-disclosure. And as far as, oh, they should have known because it was out there and this and that, well, yeah, it did happen 15 years ago. But it's the same players, and you're talking about some very, very serious things, serious enough that the RFP required disclosure of them. Okay. So to interpret this any other way would be to say that the commission can play, you know, blind to something that goes directly to responsibility when you have to award to a responsive and responsible bidder, and that you're going to reward the deliberate failure to disclose something that the RFP requires but, 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 to disclose. But there's some, as I understand, there are some facts that are, um, that are debated, that we're in debate about. Right, which is this whole city issue. And we, so be before we get there, we can get I have, there. I have a Mr. question. Chairman, may I, may I respond sure. briefly? Because I, I think we can dispense with this immediately. Uh, first of all, they're talking about something that took place 15 years ago, and they're alleging that there was some type of environmental contamination on Dodge Island. What they aren't telling you, on July 14, 1960, the city of Miami conveyed that property to Miami-Dade County. So that's not even city property. So I'm not sure what we're talking about here. We've got a copy of the deed. We've got a copy of Durham's records. We've got a copy of everything that disputes everything they just said. And it's not permitted to be discussed here today. So we can sit here and go back and he forth just on disgusted. all of this. But we're not even talking about city property, even assuming they were, what they're saying is true. Now, uh, now, now a counter to that. Give me, give me one second. I understand that he, he, he opened the doors to the fact. He just no, did. I understand that. But one thing that he did say was that it was county property, not city property. And, I, and if it was county property, then I would believe that then it, it does not affect the city. My, but my first question to the city administration, 
if you had to find someone, so say for instance, someone did not disclose, as in this case, say you, you did not disclose an environmental impact, not saying that they did not disclose for the reasons set forth in the RFP, mm. but you did not disclose something. At what point would you deem that person, would that be considered to be something that is non-responsive? Would that be something that is curable? Or how would you, how would you handle the omission of a fact in something of this matter, in this RFP? I mean, I, I can answer for how I would have looked at it, but yeah, let, the city let attorney. It, I think it's more okay. of a, a legal it's, concept. But I, I, I was just imagining that the, the procurement office probably has some sort of flexibility because I know you cure things all the time, but I'll hear both sides. Well, as you wish, Mr. Chair, uh, limited to legal issues. Uh, it is often an allegation that if a proposer fails to disclose a material fact, they can be deemed non-responsive for not answering an important question and non-responsible for um, not having full integrity. So that can be a consideration. The issue here becomes what the question was asking and how it was answered. And I believe you can hear that either from us or from, from the other persons because there's, there's really a, uh, the issue really is that the way the question was posed was, was there environmental damage to city property. Okay. So really, it's, it's you know, it, it's been, it was, it uh, can be seen that it was responded to as saying there has been no environmental damage to city property and interpreting that to mean city of Miami. Okay. And others may want to speak to that, but that's the gist of it. And, and, I, and I do just to that one point, because that's an important before, point. Before we go there. I, I, um, I, I do want to add something. And it's a fact, I mean, this is in hindsight. Speaking right to the now. mic. Sorry, this is in hindsight right now. So it's very difficult to have an answer as to what we would have done. But I will tell you that the Office of the Inspector General and the reports that were issued afterwards were very clear that what was hit, this 50, whatever it was, I, I don't want to even talk about what it was, <laughs> there was no way of anybody knowing that it was there and they had to change policy afterwards. So I don't know what we would have done. It's irrelevant. I don't know what the law office would have instructed us to do, to do, but it seems to me that there was some sort of an extenuating circumstance that... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm lost on your explanation. Uh, what I'm saying is that after, the effect, after what happened, the, the ins I'll, I'll clearly state what it was, and the inspector general did a report afterwards and found that the maps that were in existence at that time did not clearly mark what was hit. So, but, right, but I, but I think the issue is, it's irrelevant. should you have disclosed? Right, exactly. But so this is where we are. Because exactly. The details that you're putting forth, I don't, I don't. It's not I'm relevant to the this. issue. It's yes. What I, what I want to know is this. For very clearly, the, the attorney from the city attorney's office stated that the question that was put was, does, oh, was there some environmental, well, say it again, please. I don't want to. City property. We can what, was there environmental damage to city property? To city property. And that, that question was answered. So city property. Okay. So I'm going to allow you to speak on that the city property, because to me, that's dispositive of this issue. Okay. So here's what the actual RFP language says, right, in terms of disqualification. The city, capital city, referring obviously to the city of Miami, and they drafted this document. So basic law, the document, if there's any ambiguity, is construed against the drafter of the document, right? So this if, is what they are. If there's, if there's ambiguity. If there's, well, so here I'm going to the ambiguity. So the city shall automatically deem any proposal non-responsive and non-responsible as applicable, nor will the city, capital city, again, enter into any lease or other agreement with any proposer, principal, or related parties of any proposing entities whose members are in arrears for city obligation, debt, where's the environmental section right here? I'm sorry, I, I was in the wrong section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in the right section, but I'm getting to it. Let me, let me just jump to it. Yeah, here we go. Failure to disclose information. Should a proposer or any principals, related entities, or related assinees fail to disclose information relating to the following, and then it lists a number of things, 
and it goes to paragraph 8. Its role in causing any city, lowercase, owned land or improvements to incur environmental damage, environmental contamination, or liability or any other liabilities, the proposer shall be automatically disqualified from further consideration in this RFP process. Now, mind you, the RFP refers to city. Right, I would think if you had a capital lowercase. city and a lowercase city, capital city, I would give to you. City of Miami. City of Miami. Lowercase city would be uh, any city. another city. Correct. Right? And so, in this case, and that's and you hit the nail right. Name, my, as, I, as I understood, it was Miami-Dade County, which is no, it wasn't uh, actually because that's also a, a a misdirection. And of course, you have to kind of get a little bit into what Mr. Dotson opened the door to of what actually happened here. This happened in the city of Miami Beach. It was a spill. Okay, whether it was intentional, but clearly we don't believe it was intentional, but that's neither here nor there, that's irrelevant. But it created a significant spill, so significant that you had 20 miles of beaches closed, including beaches in Miami Beach, Virginia Key, Key Biscayne, all the way up to Sunny Isles. So you clearly had an impact to lowercase city-owned land because you have several cities, City of Miami Beach, it, City of Miami. City-owned, does land, is that distinguished from bodies of water? Submerged lands are lands. But and bodies of water that touch land are uh, touching land. So what you have here is you have an environmental issue without getting into the amounts and, and, and magnitude or anything, even though Mr. Dotson did open that door, okay, that caused significant impact to the point that 20 miles of beaches were closed in an area, and where it happened was right off of Miami Beach, and the spill had an effect on but 20 the, miles of beaches. But, but, this is, but this is the issue. You did not allege that in your written bid protest. Because he didn't know. But, we, but that's what I'm saying. But you didn't allege it in your written bid protest. Show me where. In, in, let's get past that first hurdle. This is like when you stop a car, right, in simple terms. You stop a car, you had to stop the car for something. You had to commit a traffic infraction before you can arrest the man for carrying marijuana inside that vehicle. Yes, he had marijuana inside the vehicle from what you're alleging. You haven't proven it. You just see the, these are facts that, or your facts that you're putting on the, before us. But tell me why you stopped the car. So in this sense, what I'm saying is I'm looking at code that looks very simple to me that says that you have a certain amount of time to file a bid protest. And it goes further to talk about what must be within that bid protest. And so I look at this as a guide to fairness for the parties that are involved within a written bid protest. And I understand where you're going with this issue. And I think that that may be something that could come up later within the process. But tell me why you pass this stop here. Be because the RFP itself, which is the document that controls this procurement, the RFP itself requires any one of us any one of us to specifically disclose any environmental damage right, that's and they marijuana. Right, right, but, but, the but they have to disclose it they have to self-report it's but give me an analogy me if i could respond it, please i will allow you to respond and i'm going to say this to you and i'm going to allow her to respond had you known well we didn't know no no i want to say i want to say had you know yes, that's you. but it's true it's, it's still had you known but you would have stated with particularity the specific facts and law upon which the protest or the solicitation would have been. You would have done that. And sometimes within the law, you have time periods, just like uh, the statute of limitations. One of the most famous cases that are going around right now is Bill Cosby and all the alleged rapes of women that he's done, right? And many of those cases, I know it's a terrible fact pattern, but many of those cases stem around the statute of limitations. Now, in the, you're talking about something as serious as rape. And, and still then, the law pays homage to the statute of limitations because that's what are on the books and that's what we abide by. So to me, this is a form of a limitation. This is a limitation on how you bring about an allegation of particular facts in a bid protest. And so I'm just trying to, I don't think you've got I, 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 No, yet. no, I understand what, what, you're, what you're trying to, the point you're making, okay? But, but here's the thing. They are required by the RFP to disclose right. this information. Just like, you're but not they failed to. to. Marijuana. Come on. No, but but the difference is that they're required. Nobody 
it, you know, who's carrying marijuana is required to, you know, wave it out the window and say, hey, I've got marijuana. In this RFP case, if, in this RFP case and in this particular RFP, they are required to disclose this. And this they is, failed to disclose it, intentionally a, failed right, to no, disclose I understand. it. And this is a bid protest. And in a bid protest, you're, you're uh, alleging exactly what you're alleging, but you just didn't do that within the written bid protest as, as by the rules. Give me a second. Give me a second. As by the rules. So let me, let me hear what counsel is saying. I just want to say briefly, you're, you're, you're going right at it. Mr. Chair, it's a due process argument. You cannot uh, be allowed to submit evidence up until the 11th hour, number one. Number two, counsel keeps trying to put it on RCI that they didn't disclose something as the way he gets past the threshold that he didn't submit something at the time when he should have submitted it. We never get to whether RCI disclosed something because it is outside of the four corners of the written bid protest. You have it right in front of you. Basic due process requires that there be time periods and they be adhered to. Right. Mr. Chairman, right does that mean that the commissioner can consider it? Here. Can't consider that issue. I, I would think be, be, a, I'll let the, be, be, because at the same time, you know, there are some things that have no statute of limitation, and and, and, and in all fairness, uh, without getting into the details, if, if something should have been disclosed and wasn't disclosed, I mean, we we can consider that. I believe as a commission. I believe that we can probably consider it. We can consider it, but I don't think this is the venue to consider. I, I would think that the venue to consider it would be when um, at the would, would, would at the award recommended to accept at the award. This is not an but award. Is that what we're doing today? No, no this is a bid protest. Right. right. This is a different no. vehicle. This is a bid protest. We're deciding an issue between two different parties. M Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Carollo, oh. and the chairman, you're both right. You can, Commissioner Carroyo, the commissioners can consider this for purposes of throwing out a bid. You, you and com Chairman Hardiman is correct that you cannot consider it for purposes of this bid protest. And it, they're two different, it's just two different they issues. Want, they want and, that, and that's the point that I'm making. This is, this in and of itself, what we're doing is an instrument that they use to settle an issue between two parties. There's, there's three parties here. And so I want to protect the integrity of this process. Now, if, it's, if this comes up, for instance, when it comes time for the award, for it, I'll give you an example. We had the, um, the, the award that the manager was recommending for rental cars. And I didn't agree with the process in which the rental cars were procured. I thought that the procurement process was too restrictive. And so we made comments at this junction, I mean, not this junction, in this, but as a commission, to expand upon the procurement process. That's not what this is. But, Mr. Chairman, at the same time, how long did that take? Well, that took and, long because right. but that guy over there. <laughs> so, again, I just don't want to take that long and then have something that may be, you know, we could address now. Right. But I, so so I what I'm saying is, are we kicking the can down the, down the road and a month from now or two months from now, we deal with it again? We, and we, could, we could or not. Be, but I, the, the reason I wouldn't quite describe it that way is because this is a process that I think you have to protect. The bid, uh, the bid protest process. And, and that's, what I'm, that's what I'm trying to, to preserve here, the bid protest process. Because if not, then you have to understand that every bid protest would have new facts that would be alleged that are worse and worse each time, and they all come in the 11th and 12th hour. Commissioner Gore. Yeah, whatever happens in here, I can tell we're going to go to court, and everybody's feeling their case. Right. So, <clears throat> what I would think is this I mean, in, in the effort, I think we've heard arguments from both sides. I'm looking at the, the resolution of protested solicitations and awards, and um, I mean, the facts are irrelevant to this, the way that I look at it, because this is how we as a board should be handling, or we should consider what comes before us. And if I have facts that came after this, if, if, if I have facts that came after this and, and, and I were um, a respondent in this case, 
I would not be very happy. And I wouldn't think that anyone who was judging these facts yeah, um, would be doing justice by allowing someone to allege things at the last minute. For that matter, like I said today, we could have another allegation. And, um, and, and, and that's not saying. But we, I mean, we're trying to decide something. Yeah, but if I could yeah. um, add something. Just a little. Really? OK. Just a little. I think it will be helpful, actually. <clears throat> First, we're not in a judicial process nor a quasi-judicial process. It's an executive process. So the commission has broad discretion to hear whatever it wants to hear as long as it's relevant. And if it goes to responsiveness or responsibility, you've heard from your attorney, you can consider it. In terms of the due process argument, OK, if what the commission is saying or what a, an entity, let's say, let's not personalize it. Let's just say any governing body of, of a city or a county or what have you. If what they want to do is they want to give the non-disclosing party who knew that they did something, that they had to disclose something but chose not to disclose it, an opportunity to prepare and counter and this and that, then it's very simple. The commission can simply uh, adjourn the item and pick it up two weeks later and they can but fully I, prepare. Then, but then you would be stepping outside of, of the resolution of section 18-104. Why should you be able to step outside the process but then you allege that they're stepping outside the because process? They, because the threshold issue is they had to disclose it according to the RFP. They, if, if anybody knew what they did, it's the person who did it, right? right? We didn't know it. Our, uh, the, the third place finisher, Typhon, didn't know it. So, so we're going to reward the non-disclosing party who knew they had to disclose something in an RFP and protect them from having to answer as to why they didn't disclose that? I mean, the bottom line is this, the way that I, the way that I see this. This is about process, right? This part that we're talking about right now is about process. And I don't think that you've stated anything that gets you through, that, 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 that gets you out of this, this process. I hear you. The boogeyman came in the middle of the night. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? The boogeyman came in the middle of the night, and, and the city of Miami is going to be in trouble because of the person that chose not to respond, that you think, to, to a question that was asked. The opposing counsel says that we responded. As a matter of fact, um, the fact of the matter is that that was a county, not a city, and it does not apply. That is, that is, that is, is but if I continue to go down that line and continue to, if I, if I said to you, okay, prove it. Prove that it was a city. Put your evidence on right now to show me that it was a city. And he's going to say, counselor, or he's going to say, commission, I'm not prepared for this because that was not alleged in the solicitation. Now you're going to say, well, give me a continuance. And now you've gone outside the four corners of your bid protest. And, so, and that's the thing about it. And that's why I'm having trouble with this. But if I were arrested for a crime, the allegations would be either in the, in, in the indictment or within the four corners of the A form or something of that nature. And so how can you, at trial, accuse someone of doing more than what they were originally accused of? Because you're, the law requires the commission to consider, to award to a responsive, responsible bidder. Your attorney just said that. And if there is something that goes directly to responsibility, you can consider it. And you're not awarding today. That's exactly that's, the point. And that's, and, and that's my, that's, that's the, thank you, Counselor. That's where, I'm, that's where I'm at today. The way I look at it is that this is not an award, this is a bid protest. And I would like to, and I'm asking, what I'm asking of my commissioners is that we stick within the confines of a bid protest. And there's another question that we have to ask, because this one's about, um, about an additional allegation. There's another question as to standing. And so as regards to this, and I'll break this down simpler, because I think the best way to handle it is, is, is a motion. So I would ask someone to move um, to determine that the allegation, the additional allegation that is not within the four corners of the bid protest not be allowed to be discussed in the bid process. Move it. And I'll second it. Is there any, dis let's discuss that matter. Yes. The bid protest. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm hearing a little, I, hear, I heard two reasons of why it shouldn't be heard, and, and one of them I want to give something to, but the other one I, I didn't like at all, which is that it shouldn't have been included because everyone should have known about it because it was in the news 16 years ago. I didn't know about it. And by the fact that they're bringing it late, they Vice didn't Vice Chairman, it. I'm sorry. If you could get close to the mic because... Sorry. Thank you. Um, but you don't need to me, me to repeat myself, do you? You heard me? 
Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, no matter when it's discovered, something this material, I, I'd like to know if, if the city knew about it but felt that it was not relevant enough to disqualify or if they simply didn't know about it. At some point, whether or not this is the right time to deal with it, I want to deal with that. I don't know all the facts of that. And I'm not saying that I believe at this point that there was contamination of city grounds or, 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 or whether that's the relevant point or not, but something of that magnitude uh, needs to be dealt with at some point. Now, if it's not here, when is it and how? That's the next thing to be discussed. I'll um, allow the city to respond to that. But see, this is why I didn't want to get into the facts. Because when you start to say, yep. if it's something of that magnitude, now you're, you're stepping away from the process that have been identified in yep. the bid protest because of a gut a feeling well, and emotion. what they, they said. I haven't heard all the facts. Well, I'm just, but that's my yep. point, though, is that he, it's, it's like, it's one of those things where the law is the law without our emotional mm. appeal to it. It's the law. So no matter how you feel about the law, if it's the law, it's the law. But... City. Mr. Chairman? Oh, can we have a response? Sure, absolutely. That's exactly the point. I was going to have a man to the question, but that's exactly the point. And you mentioned it before when you gave your anecdote about, you know, rape having a statute of limitations. That's pretty material. That's a pretty rape. horrific it's, crime. It's Yet at some point we stop the clock it's for reasons of fairness. And so it's this relevant. is the same exact reason. If we want to get into whether the city knew or whether big city, a capital city, lowercase city meant one city or it's another city, then we're getting argument. into the facts. Yeah. Irrelevant. And how many days was that clock? Five, I five days. Five. five. And, but here's the thing. This hasn't been awarded. It still comes to us for awarding. Right. But that's later on down. So Correct. I guess what I'm hearing from my colleague, and it seems like uh, I couldn't have said any better. I don't want to wait down the line. I want to talk and discuss it now. But that's not the process. But OK. If for that matter, I'll okay, say, okay, but I'll tell you this, for that matter, I'll pass you the gavel and you all can fight this out all day because that's what it's going to take. Because no one, and then you, because you're, you're outside of the process. If we're talking about emotions, then forget the process. This big protest. The, and it's important. No to, doing and it's important to note that the first rank bidder also has rights. But, but Mr. Chairman. It, but Mr. Chairman, I need another copy of this, by the way. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, He's making a Mr. Point. Chairman. Okay. can I let me go see what it was? <laughs> but Mr. Chairman, here you go. Doesn't the city commission also have a process? And, and we, we, <laughs> your, your processor is the city code, which is the section we're talking about, right? That's your process, right? But the city commission also has a process, and we could discuss up here in the sunshine wh whatever we want. And, and this is important enough where I think two commissioners were saying, hey, we may want to discuss this now. Uh, but the, the and, thing and, and we're not, we're not, we're not breaking the process. I think you are. I think, I think the process is defined by the section. You can have the, the, the city attorney speak to it. I think that, you know, we wear many hats on the, on the city commission. Sometimes I wear a hat as the CRA chairman. Sometimes I wear a hat as the, the chairman of the commission. Today, I'm wearing a hat as a chairman, but I'm sitting as a, a judge of a bid protest. Sometimes I'm sitting as a judge of whether or not I should accept the, 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 the city manager's recommendation. Today, there was a bid protest. The city manager is recommending, well, that's the resolution. <clears throat> there was a bid protest. The bid protest is a written document that's provided that has allegations that are within it. And for instance, the only reason that you know how to file a bid protest is because of this. If you didn't have this, then someone could just say, ah, I don't like it. Like for instance, I'll give you an example. Today we had an issue with, I think it was the crepas or something of that nature. We had a gentleman that, that stood before the lecture. The first question I asked him, sir, did you bid? He said, no, he did not bid, right? So at that point, he can't even follow the bid protest because he's not a person that he's not a, he's not an aggrieved party in that sense. Now let me let me just clarify something, and I think this is what's really at the core of what you're saying, Commissioner Caroyo. As, as a part of just yes. real quick, you're right, uh, Chairman. Yet there was nothing precluding you from asking any follow-up questions or any questions to that person even though he didn't bid. But that was, you know, I let him speak for two minutes because everyone is allowed two minutes to speak. That was, that's the first part. And the second part is that 
what was before us at that time was an award, not a bid protest. But my point is, regardless of what was in front of us, you still could have asked additional questions or any member of this commission could have asked additional question or, or requested uh, more information from that person. And that's what I'm saying. But there's no process identified for that. So what you're talking about is just the authority for me to ask any person to stand up, take the lectern, and ask them a question. This is not that same thing. This is a process that is, that is I mean, it's written, it's a written down process that states with particularity what you must do to file a bid protest and that keeps you from extending the time for uh, adding new uh, or adding things to a bid protest or getting more time for a bid protest. In fact, what we're discussing are facts that I'm trying not to get into, but facts that go towards things that are not alleged in the affidavit. And that's, that's, that's a big issue. That's a big issue. And that's what I just wanted to clarify and, and probably what uh, Commissioner Carollo is having a hard time with is he is, he is correct in that if he feels, after reading all the material he read, after knowing everything there is about the RFP, if he decides that there are just so many questions about everything that he has investigated, that he wants to throw out all bids before hearing a bid protest because he says that he doesn't want to kick anything down into the future, if there's things that he wants to know about and throw everything out, that is within this purview of the commission. However, you need to give reasons why you would want to do that, whether it's environmental questions, et cetera, et cetera. You need to give a whole, it can't be arbitrary and capricious. That's the first thing. That is separate and apart from the process that Co Chairman Hardiman is explaining that if you're going to do a bid protest, that has to be within the four corners of what was submitted so you would have to look at the bid protest and analyze whether you're throwing out one bidder. You'd have to look at the second protest to see if you're throwing out two people. So that's why it all has to be very process oriented. So, and I hope that clarifies things. Ch Chairman, Mr. Chairman, may I, uh, may I just clarify something? Uh, getting back to the code 18104, again, it's very ex uh, explicit that it's the, the director of purchasing, in this case it's the dream director, that considers what's in the file protest. That doesn't preclude the commission from considering but, things but, outside but of it. It also doesn't preclude me from asking you to leave, right? Yeah. It doesn't preclude me from, from buying uh, a Whopper with cheese in the middle of, the, of, the, of this, uh, this discussion. I mean, so what I'm saying, what you're saying is that the absence of those, that direction gives me the authority to do it. You, you have discretion, this, this commission but, has no, no. discretion to consider anything relevant, but material, and pertinent. But do you have anything that, that says what you just said? Or are you saying that because it's not within the four corners of the Correct. Code? You have to go with what the code says. If the code prohibited the commission from considering something outside of protest, it would expressly say that. In the absence of that, there's an expression in but Latin. Code, and I'll, 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 no, but, I'll, let me say this. Paul, go ahead. This code doesn't say, I'm, I'm trying to find at any point, does it say, Commission. It, says, it doesn't say commission at all. C correct. And there's a there's there's a there's a there's a principle in law. To, it's a Latin expression, and I can't say because I'll butcher it. But but the inclusion of one is the exclusion of the other. Meaning, if you expressly include something, you by definition exclude what you have not included. If the code intended to prohibit or keep the commission from considering a fact. It would have said so. It doesn't. It does prohibit that's, the director that's a theory. of. I think that's a theory of how someone reads the law. And no, I'm saying there's a principle of law. So, for instance, <laughs> but, but if I ask uh, Councillor Dotson the same question, you said because it does not include commission, that commission it, is included. It, it, it also does not include the mayor. Does the mayor have that authority? Here? No, but there's a process. Everything comes before the commission as a whole. And so you that's, that's have the ability. Uh, on the day is to consider any fact you want. And so while the director in a bid protest may not consider something, the commission may have questions. So let me, let me before we go further, um, Madam City Attorney, where is, the, where is the part of the code that brings bid protests in front of the city commission? Is there a part of the code that identifies that? 
same section? The, the same section in 18104. Here's, here's what says. Read it. And that's Right. It's so right after the same section that you were going through that has to do with 18104A2C, mm -hmm. right after that is A2B. B. And that's where it says the authority to resolve protests. Right. The chief procurement officer shall have the authority subject to approval of the city manager and the city attorney to settle mm -hmm. and resolve any written protest. Obviously, that didn't happen. So it needs to go further where it says a chief procurement officer shall obtain the requisite proposals and communicate said decision to the protesting party and shall submit said decision to the city commission within 30 days after he or she receives the protest. In cases involving more than $25,000, the decision of the chief procurement officer shall be submitted for approval or disapproval thereof to the city commission after a favorable recommendation by the city attorney and the city manager. Mr. Chairman, you, you've, yeah. you've mentioned a few times that the recommended proposer has rights, and I assume that what they want to do is continue to trample all over them. They've decided that they're going to determine what the process is. They're going to avoid what it says in the RFP. I'm going to come back to 18104 in a minute because it actually does not apply in this case because that's what your code says. We've been spending all this time on 18104. We refuse to look at the RFP itself and what it says. In this case, it DREAM doesn't resolve the bid protest. You do. They keep telling you that DREAM resolves the bid protest, but your RFP says on page 38 and 39 that you do. So when they decide what they're going to put in their RFP and their response to the RFP, and by the way, it's quite a statement given the size of this project and the due diligence that was required to respond to this RFP, it's something as big as what they are talking about. They did not have the due diligence to find out that it doesn't apply here. They don't realize that 18104, it doesn't even work. In this case, it is pages 38 and 39 of the RFP, which says you resolve the, the bid protest, not dream. They are wrong. Okay, your, so county you your city attorney said 18104 applies, and I agree. But even if you fall back on the RFP, I concur with counsel that the commission is the okay, ultimate so arbiter say, so and decider this. of this. Let's say that the commission does, the, the commission is the, the ultimate decision maker on this issue. I'm inclined to take a procedure. I don't want to willy nilly, arbitrarily, capriciously, any of those things decide something of this magnitude without a process. So <clears throat> as, as a chairman, I would take one thing I, want I would take this process and I would say, I'm going to look at the written award, the written protest that was filed. That's the way that I would think mm -hmm. would be the way to handle it, a situation like this. And it's yes. very disingenuous to stand before you and say they just found out and they had a short Okay, let me just let me interrupt counsel. I apologize. We did not know. I can't say it any clearer to this commission. I'll put my hand on a stack of Bibles. We did not know. And I don't appreciate counsel telling me that we are misrepresenting. That's right. Listen. That's absolutely Listen. right. We did not know. You speak to me. You speak well, to this board. Well, we, we, he's calling me a liar no, and I take I offense to that. And, and so do I, Listen. because I'm part of this too. And, and, and okay. by the way, his client, counsel, knew, about his client knew about the spill. Counselor, 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 counselor. That's like the cat call. Listen, listen to what I'm saying to you. I don't believe that you, I don't believe, I don't believe that your, the way that you're, you're describing your right to have an addendum to your written protest, I don't think you have that right. That's what I believe. Now, when it, when it, when it, about the, the, the facts that are being alleged and the withholding of certain information on a, on, a, uh, on, a, on a bid, that's a matter that we can decide when it comes time to decide it. But today, it's not before us. I, I don't see how you can bring it before us. And I understand the, 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 the arguments that are 
really um, outside of the law when you say um, no one should be awarded a bid project for uh, omitting a special fact when there's a dispute in these facts. You have one position, they have another. Now, if we were deciding those facts today, we could do that. But today is not the day for deciding those facts. Today is the day about deciding whether or not you first meet the four corners of, of filing a written bid protest. And so I think I, I, I don't think anyone's position about this is going to change. So the only thing we can do is decide this. The only thing we can do is decide this as, as a board. So I, I made a motion in a second. Um, I don't think that this precludes us from looking at these issues when it comes time. But listen, and I say this because I think it's, it's, it's worthy of noting. There's a time and a place for all things. This is not the time, but it soon will be the place. And so I say that to you to say, I think we should, be, we should proceed cautiously any time that someone wants to go beyond the process to force us to make a decision based off of things that are not outlined within the process uh, that, that we've identified for ourselves to follow. And so I think to protect the procurement process, protect the bid process, you should support me in my motion not to allow um, this additional fact beyond what is written in section 18-104. That's my motion. Mr. Chair? Mm, I, don't believe there's, I don't believe there's any public input in the bid protest. There's no public input at this time. This is just um, having to do with procedural matters that have to do with the bid protest and what is brought in to uh, the protest for the commissioners to consider. There'll be time. You'll have an opportunity. You, you will have an opportunity to speak, though. Just not right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this, this all goes to why I asked initially if and why this is a quasi-judicial process. I understand that there's a process with which they um, enter the protest, but once it comes to us, right. I believe we can ask any question we want, even if that protest wasn't filed, the, the last one about contamination. If I just found it on Google today, this morning, on the way in here, I could ask about that during this protest process. This doesn't get excluded from our discussion simply because it wasn't part of the bid protest process. Am I correct in that? You can ask whatever question you want, but it's very different than they get to argue it as part of their bid protest and you totally have to consider it as part of your decisions for the bid protest. But if you, just like you said, you can ask whatever questions you want if you want more information, definitely. Mr. Chairman? Before we move forward, before we move forward, I just, I was alerted to an issue that I think is worthy for us to discuss is something that we should decide before we move further. Uh, Mr. Brown, yes, I'm yes, sure sir. you are aware, um, it was disclosed to the clerk that, well, I'll let the clerk dis uh, describe it for himself. Yes, no, it, it's, uh, Mr. Brown has, has not registered as a lobbyist. However, um, it has been expressed to us that uh, Mr. Brown has uh, all intent to complete the ethics course uh, from the Miami-Dade Commission on Ethics and Public Trust and to fill out the, the necessary lobbyist registration form and the appropriate filing fees. <laughs> Now, I'll say this. Um, we have in the past allowed lobbyists to continue to speak in, lo in lobby sure. before this body, even though they hadn't done that, if they were to promise and to, to fulfill the requirements. I know we've, I don't know, I, I don't, I know we've never followed up on whether or not they've done it or not. Um, so that's something for us to consider. It's up to this body to decide that. But I will say, I will say this, where we have the issue that we're discussing right now, which is a process issue, and then we have the lobbying thing, which is a process issue. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't look good, but it's up to my colleagues whether or not they want to decide uh, to allow you to, to do this and, and file your requirements later. So. I'll make the motion. <clears throat> Chair, no motions necessary. No? Okay. It's, it's, um, it's his ethical obligation, 
And if you want me to follow up, I will after. Um, but it, it's his ethical obligation. I know I take a lot of ethics courses. <laughs> right, I'm a big target. So you have to do it if I have to do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. You recognize, sir? You recognize? Who wants me? With regard to the well, I mean, there's no, no, no. This is not in reference to the, the lobbying issue. Apparently, the lobbying issue is not an, is not an issue. The city right. attorney's going to follow up with it. Okay, right. Yes, and the vice chairman was was basically asking whether he can ask questions with regard to this. I I told them that this commission can ask any questions. It's just whether they can use it as a part of their argument and their presentation and a reason for you to knock, you know, someone else out. That, that is the, it, it can't be used and, and be the basis of your uh, protest um, or granting a protest, but it can uh, be something to give you more information. And, you can't ask any questions. And, and, I'll, and I'll caution you by saying this. The more facts you put on the table regarding the issue, the more that that court reporter is going to reflect that you could have probably made your decision, because that's what the next argument is going to be, that you made your decision based off of those facts that are put on the table that should not have been relevant at this time. Feeling pretty good. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may, just I just wanted to add this thing up because you've been discussing it at length. In conferring with the uh, procurement department, and though I realize this is a real estate, they are using the same protest procedures as the procurement me. department. The procurement department uh, and the law department has uh, interpreted this past practice, past precedent. That section is meaning that you. Uh, must allege the grounds of your protest. You know, this is not the first time this interpretation has been made. As for the nature of this being quasi-judicial or executive, there's two cases from Dade County. One is MOR Software versus Miami-Dade County at 895 Southern 2nd, 1086. And the other one is Charles M. Scher versus Board of County Commissioners of Dade County of 188 Southern 2nd, 871. Um, and they both have said that uh, these kinds of things are executive action. Uh, that's not to say that in legislation and things like that, you could not make it quasi-judicial, but uh, Dade County, uh, you know, does not treat theirs as, as quasi-judicial. I just, I just wanted to state that. Mr. Thank Chairman, just much. a question on the lobbyist registration. I believe the person who violated your process as it relates to lobbyist registration also signed at the bid protest. And I just want to make sure, I don't know whether he is participating in any other lobbying activity in addition to just being here before you, but this is not the first time that you are hearing from this person in the context of, a, of lobbying. It's not just today. He signed the bid protest. I'm not sure what the right, well, but this is. That's a, irrelevant. This is a, what's the relevance? Yeah, that's what, we, that's what we're discussing right now, relevancy, aren't we? Yeah, that's um, So I, I will say this. So there's a motion, there's a second on the floor. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, the way that I see it is that I'm saying to, to the board members that I would approach this cautiously because I think that you should, you should follow the law. Do you, uh, miss, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, do you feel that there would be legal risk for us to discuss this? And I'm going to, I guess I should ask this to our city attorney, and this is the, the advice I have to rely on. If we discuss, for example, the contamination issue and it is later deemed or even deemed now uh, through, the, through the chair's motion that it's not germane to the protest, could that be used uh, by whoever loses as legal grounds to say that this was decided incorrectly? Would we be opening ourselves up um, to risk legal risk by having that discussion even though I can ask anything I want, the chair is warning that there is potential, he didn't say legal risk, but he said he's warning us to follow process. I'm asking you, are we at legal risk for hearing something that may be outside the bid protest uh, um, statute of limitations? As part of the bid protest, um, yes, you could be opening yourself up for, for certain um, arguments by whoever um, wins or loses that bid protest. Um, in, in a general, um, just in a general sense, if you were to ask a question and it would not at all um, prejudice your decision, then that obviously is a different situation. Um, You're not helping me. <laughs> I would encourage you, 
I would encourage you to just stay within the, the four corners of this bid protest because that, is, that has been our past practice. That, has, that is what we have always interpreted as being uh, part of the code. Um, there are obviously other situations in, when you, in which you can ask all the questions that you deem appropriate. For purposes of this bid protest, I would encourage you to, to stay within um, the document that was filed originally. At the time of an award, you can ask other questions. So we could possibly deny the award at that point yeah. based on this issue. Yes. But, but that will be, that's why I said kicking the, the can down the road oh, because so I'm, I'm, that would take. You're talking a can of milk and a, and a glass of wine. It's two, two totally different issues. I, I don't see why it is because we're saying, okay, we can't deal with it now. We have to deal with it later. Because this is a bid protest, not an award. But, but, but the city attorney, correct me if I'm wrong, Madam City Attorney, you said that we could even, and this was your words, not mine, you said that this commission could even decide to throw the whole thing out. Right. At, you can, this, at this meeting. You can, you can decide to throw the whole thing out, yes, but not in the confines of the bid protest in, in just a general sense. The bid protest only has to do with one person at a time or two people at a time in, in, for but, now. But why would we throw the whole thing out if we haven't heard from well, that, that all is, the issues? Other reasons. All the reasons, which is, I guess, you why Commissioner Russell and myself are trying to Right, but that is, that is with regard to the, the grand scheme of things, not based on any one or two bid protests. You're saying that there are other reasons or reasons or this reason, whatever the case may be, but you're giving reasons as to why you think the whole thing should be thrown out, not in the confines of a bid protest. It, it's two separate things. Just not. And obviously, it's, it's the rejection of, of all bids, not one. Unless you're doing a bid protest, staying within the confines, and then looking forward. So, you know, look, not, I, just, I just play a lawyer on TV. <laughs> no, but I'm saying this to say that um, we're getting, we heard arguments from counsel, both sides. The advice that we're receiving from our council is saying, I think you should stay within the, the four corners. It's my opinion, I have one vote like you do, that we should stay within the four corners. Uh, it, it, it is probably the smart thing to do. Many times we have to make decisions that we don't like, but it's because it's along the lines of the law. But, but did it? You, if your vote is your vote. I mean, you could vote, we could vote, the vote could fail. And then we have to have another vote, which is to use, to allow them to, to, um, to participate within the bid protest. We're going to vote, and that probably will fail also. I feel as though I'm being asked to decide on something where there's a potential relevant, potentially relevant issue out there that I'm not to consider. And it frustrates me very much that, one, if it is germane, if it is important, that it didn't get into the protest, or two, that our city administration didn't catch it if it was relevant. Now, we're not able to discuss that if it's not part of the protest, but I want to know that. I want to know if our city considered this and dismissed it early on, knowing the newspaper articles. I recognize and I believe the, the, uh, the protester that they didn't know about it until now because, of course, they would have brought it within the time limit if they had. That only makes sense. Uh, my question is, did the city know about it and simply dismiss it as not relevant? Or did they not realize it and consider it as part of this? Because I, I sincerely do not believe the argument that everyone should have known about this, we didn't have to bring it up. Either you didn't have to bring it up because it didn't qualify within the verbiage of City of Miami contamination, of the RFP disqualification, or you didn't disclose it because... Well, Vice Chairman, I will say that um, one of the attorneys said that he, he, one of the attorneys put on the record <clears throat> what it was that was being discussed and that it did not apply to his company that he represents because it was Miami-Dade County property, not city property. That's what he said. 
there was another counselor that, that mentioned after response to one of the attorneys that um, they should have known in a sense that it would have, you should have known because it was something that, that in this, I guess in this industry, it was a big deal. And so, but, but that still doesn't get us to where we are. So for instance, if we go with what counselor, uh, um, was it Brown? Are you an attorney? Yes. Okay, counselor. Yeah, good, good. Me too. Let me talk about that. That uh, counselor Brown, his point is that you should be able to supplement in this case because this is important information to know. Is it because you got to remember there's two things, and they're arguing two two very different things. One, they're saying, look, you can consider this. We have a process that I'm that I believe we should abide by. That the city attorney said we should abide by. He's saying that you don't have to. That's what he's saying. And then he's saying, not only do you not have to, but I'm going to allege something that we should use to disqualify another bidder, just so happens to be the winning bidder. And so, versus the winning bidder saying, look, I was responsive. I did not have to answer that question positively because it did not affect a city. And so the question is, are you going to allow someone to allege something to, uh, to at, at this point, is a responsible bidder outside of the parameters that we have identified in the law? And that's why I said you have the law and then you have how you feel about the law. Mr. Chair, is it, is it your concern simply that it's not fair and shouldn't be heard, or is that it would weaken our, the strength of our decision if it were decided on the wrong issue? Well, I think that one is unfair and it should not be heard because that's what the process allows. Period. Period. I think that if, and I, I want to stress period again, that is what the process is. Secondly, I think that if you find yourself making a decision based off of facts that are not within the written protest, you're really you're adding injury to insult. Or is it insult to injury? Vice Chairman, at the time, let, let's um, carry, carry this out in just its, in steps. You have a, a bid protest before you. You listen to the facts as they are presented and the argument that will be presented based on the bid protest. You dispose of those bid protests, however you do. At the time of award or before award, you can ask of the administration, you can do additional research, and you could do in, uh, any due diligence that you feel that you need in order to be able to grant that award. Please do not feel that right now, unfortunately, it because I understand Commissioner Carollo as well. You want to deal with it now. You want to dispose of it now. You don't want to kick the can down the curb. I, I understand. But the, the can will probably be in, in, in another two weeks when you come back for an award. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen right now because we're, we still have to go through the bid protest. But you're confined right now within the bid protest and what was submitted. Madam City Attorney, but... And I, th I, and I don't want to speak for Commissioner Russell, but I, I think what we're trying to do, you said, well, you will know or you could do your investigation or analysis, you know, two weeks from now. But we're saying, okay, at that time, he and I can't speak. I can't speak to uh, the chairman. I can't speak to Commissioner Gord. We're here, in, you know, in the sunshine, and, and we're saying, okay, what's the difference of two weeks or right now? Uh, I, I mean, in all fairness, because we want to deal with it right now. We're in a different vehicle. I mean, this, the vehicle that we're in is made to move us from point A to point B. The vehicle that you're proposing moves us from point, from point A to point Z. And what's wrong from, uh, of going from point A to point Z because now and dealing with it now instead of dealing with it two weeks where, the reason I, we, where, where we're still in the dark? The, the, the reason I think so is because at the time we were looking at this <clears throat> for the bid, for the bid, say, a, a approval, the recommendation of the, the manager, section 18-104 doesn't apply. Then our hands are not tied. Then we're able to, to, I can question, you know, Mr. Manager, you said two apples. Why did you say two apples? There should have been three apples. You know, you, you, then you can play with the procurement process at that time. But like I say, I mean, 
look, yeah, it's, I, it's, I, you vote your, you vote how you feel. I think, you know, what's going to happen is just the way that I see it. I don't know how Commissioner Gord is going to vote, uh, but I, I, I have some inclination of how to the left and to my right of me are going to vote, and I know what I'm going to do because I'm going to follow what the, what the, you know, the section. 18-104 gives me to follow. And, and if, if it fails because it's a split, there's going to have to be another motion. And I couldn't imagine another motion that will be acceptable if it was already a split on this. To put it in the context that you all do on a biweekly basis for rezonings and exceptions and things of that nature, first you deal with the rezoning. And sometimes you have questions, but you just don't deal with it at that time because the project isn't before you. It's just a plain rezoning. Then it comes back for an exception or for, for some other um, type of approval that comes before you, and then you deal with that at that time. So it's just the proper time with which to deal with certain issues. And I, I just wanted to put it in a context that's more akin to you and you're more familiar with. Mr. Chair, I'm not, I'm not decided, honestly. For me, it's about keeping the integrity and strength of the legal process to where what decisions we made aren't overturned later because we didn't follow process. And that's why I'm listening to you. I'm listening to Commissioner Carroyo because I find this to be a very relevant issue, not knowing yet the magnitude, not knowing yet whether it's actually should or should not have disqualified them. But I want to hear it. But wanting to know more. But it's, but it's an issue can't. that is not alleged within the four corners of the affidavit. And, and, and I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, but they made it to this level already. Can now, as a commission, uh, go ahead and, and listen to the additional information that I, I guess uh, Commissioner Russell and myself what I'm all about. But, but the thing about it is that, one, we shouldn't be hearing it because that's not what the process allows for. And I think that when you go further than that, once you hear it, and we've already heard the facts, or some of the facts, uh, then it becomes prejudicial. And so then I'm making a decision based off of what? What are we deciding this case on? What are we deciding what we're doing today on? You know, I thought it was about the written protest. That's what I came here to decide today, a written protest. I'm, I'm considering much bigger issues in this. As important as this RFP is, this isn't a, this isn't we put out bid to, to get some supplies for a building or a new vehicle. Exactly. This is a very long contract on a very big property, waterfront property that will go to referendum and go before the people. Exactly. Um, our decision is so important. Um, I don't want to leave anything in the dark. I want to by, by the same token, I want to follow all the process correctly so that no mistakes are made that disqualify our decisions or make things get overturned. I have problems with our entire RFP process, which is another uh, uh, discussion, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's to be had here. Uh, the, the reasons that, that we may go into the different options that have been put before us of, of accepting one or the other or throwing the whole thing out, um, you know, may go way beyond the, the contamination issue. I have another motion. I move that we continue this item until we have full commission so that we won't have a deadlock on these very simple issues. Is there a second to that? You may not be here on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second to that? You would like uh, to continue? I move. Yeah, you're I you're move moving to continue. the further side of them. Yeah. I, 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 the way that uh, I look at I this. I will second it then. The way that I look at this, this won't be decided with, with four people. You need a fifth person to make this decision because we've, we've taken way too much time just to get past a, what I, what I would interpret as a very simple question of the law. Procedural <laughs> item. Right. A very simple um, question of the law. We have a motion. We have a second. And I was kidding, by the way. I know Commissioner Suarez had to travel. I was making a joke. Um, and, and just for the record, that means that uh, uh, Commissioner Gort withdrew his motion from 8.22 and Commissioner yes. uh, Hardiman withdrew his second from yes. 8.22 p.m. I think, I think we should set it for a time certain um, to clarify. So this would come up 
No, this could be on any day. It's not. It's, it's an RE item. So, uh, our party's comfortable attacking this item at our next commission meeting. Yes. Now, now during this time, don't go find more facts. The Take the course. The whole works. Let me. Let me ask. Yes. Sure. Yes. Gave you an information. I will not be here in the morning, or no, June okay. or June ninth. On, you said so, you would not be here in the morning on June 9th? I'll be here after lunch. We have a motion. We have a second. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we need to open the floor for discussion want, on a continuance? Clarify, I want to clarify the, uh, the motion. Our next meeting is what, June? June 9th. It's June, June 9th. And remember that I have reset or will be requesting to reset two shade, shade meetings because I was, uh, obviously, I didn't want you all to fall asleep on me in the shade meeting. So just... And when you're doing your time certains, just remember I still need to do those. Well, then maybe we need to choose another day. Is, is, is July more appropriate? Mr. Chairman, two, two things. Uh, don't forget to this item. If we go through this first step of the process and you come back with a contract to be awarded, it has to go on to a ballot. So by continuing to kick this can down the road, what you were basically saying is that the incumbent stays and this project gets delayed. So June 9th in the afternoon, we'll, we'll be here. That happens to be my birthday. You can bring a cake, and I'll be here in the afternoon. But June 9th we'll be here to is wish fine for us birthday. at 2 o'clock. And we'll be here to wish you happy birthday. On I'm sure you will. <laughs> now, his, his recommendation was June 9th at 10 o'clock. I found that 2 o'clock time service for this commission never worked. So I don't fool myself into that any longer. Um, it just will end up being another one of these uh, types of nights. I know that the record, the record is probably going to reflect that we've had this discussion, so I'm sure that this will all be considered a part of the record and what we start to discuss. We're going to have to supplement the record because we don't have a commission that's, that's been here, so be prepared to make those arguments again. I think that we're going to um, probably provide a little bit more <coughs> of a... Well, it depends on the commission how they feel about it. So if they need more time to hear more of the issues and discuss this longer, then that's what it will be. But June 9th at, um, what do you think, Commissioner Gore? Can Five? Three? Three's fine. I'll be here. She wants to do her shade meetings then. As, as long as, right, as long as you let me have my shade meeting at, you know, two or three before you start. Does your shade meeting have to be June 9th? She's I mean... Yeah, I, I need direction on those two How cases about that I have today. All right, four o'clock time, sir. Four o'clock time, certain June 9th. That's my motion. We have a motion. We have a second. Um, all in favor? I'm sorry. Uh, do you have discussion? Hi. Uh, yeah. The only the, the the only question I have is in the meantime. You know, there's a lot of questions that I think you had and I had that we don't have any answers to, but I, I guess we have to wait or. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get lobbied for the next two weeks, and I'm sure we'll get a lot of input. <laughs> and I hope all of our lobbyists are registered by then. Yeah. Uh, we have a motion for a continuance, uh, deferral, continuance. We have a deferral, sir. Deferral. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes.